Exam 1, Part 3. Types of carbons encountered in alkanes. Go ahead and write down these different groups. You might want to pause the video, write down all these groups, and then I'll go ahead and discuss them with you. Classifying carbons has to do with how many R groups are attached to that carbon. In a primary carbon, one R group is attached. In a secondary carbon, two R groups will be attached. In a tertiary, three R groups attached. And a quaternary will have four R groups attached. What an R group is? R is a generalization for any alkyl group, any size R group. Here's some examples. So let's take a look at the quaternary that I have written in the middle of the screen versus the one on the right hand side. They're both quaternary carbons because there's four R groups. What I wanted you to see is that sometimes when we have R groups, we might want to designate them as being different from each other. So one technique some people use are these tick marks. So for example, you would have the first R group would have none, the second one one, the next one two, and so on. Multiple bonds. Each bond is counted as one R group. Take a look at this carbon here. We need to figure out how many R groups are attached to it. Looking to the left, it has one carbon. Looking to the right, it has two bonds to carbon. Each multiple bond counts separately when we're classifying carbons. This carbon right here would be a tertiary carbon. The one to the right of it, two bonds to the left, one bond to the right, it's also a tertiary carbon. What would the carbon on the left hand side be? How many carbons is it bonded to? It's a primary carbon, same with the one on the other end here. So here's some example of different carbon types. In this particular exercise, I want you to go ahead and circle the primary carbons. There might be other carbon types in the molecule, but for this part, I want you to circle the primary. And the next slide, we'll practice circling other types of carbons. All right, this carbon right here is primary, and this one is also primary. This particular molecule has two primary carbons in it. Looking at this structure here, we have a primary carbon here. This one's not primary, it has bonds to two carbons. This only has bonds to one. That's also a primary carbon. One way you can look at the CH3 group, I've taken the one on the left here, there's a CH3, CH3, and I've expanded just one group of CH3. So I want you to go ahead and see that this carbon really only has one R group, the other groups are hydrogen. Okay, for this part, let's go ahead and circle the secondary carbons. How you do this is you take a look at the carbon, see how many carbons it is bonded to, and the number of, bond, the number of carbons it's bonded to is its classification, primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. So go ahead and pause the video, and in your lecture notes, circle the secondary carbons, the tertiary carbons, and the quaternary carbons. Restart the video, and we can check your work. All right, let's compare what you have to what I have. This first example has one secondary carbon. The other two would be classified as primary. The second structure to the right here, where I'm to circle secondary carbons, the second one in and the third one over, those are both secondary carbons because each of them are bonded to two other carbons. Tertiary carbons, did you see four of them? This carbon right down here, you might have missed it. It is a tertiary carbon because we have to keep in mind we're classifying carbons based on primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary. Each bond counts individually. So this carbon right here has one bond of carbon going up and two more bonds going down. So this is a tertiary carbon. Quaternary carbons, this one has two. We can see the four bonds to carbon here pretty clearly. Did you catch this one? Physical properties of organic compounds and how they differ from inorganic compounds. Organic compounds, their bonds are covalent, while inorganic compounds, their bonds are ionic. Solubility of organic compounds, they're not water soluble. The exception is some organic compounds with a few number of carbon atoms and they have a polar bond such as an OH group, those can sometimes be water soluble. 
The bigger the R group, though, the more carbons, the less soluble they become. Ionic compounds are usually water-soluble. Organic compounds and melting point. Organic compounds tend to have low melting points, so they tend to be gases, liquids, and low melting solids, while inorganic compounds are typically liquids and high melting solids. There is one inorganic compound, NH3, that is a gas. NH3, ammonia, is not considered an organic compound because it doesn't contain carbon. Properties of alkanes. The first four alkanes, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, are gases at room temperature. Alkanes with 5 to 15 carbons are liquids at room temperature. Alkanes with 16 or more carbons are waxes with low melting solids. So these three properties of alkanes, one great way that you can summarize this is any time you have an alkane with fewer than five carbons, it's going to be a gas. More than 15, it's going to be a solid. Alkanes are odorless, colorless, and tasteless. Odorless, I know that at times if we have a fire on, we're using propane, or if we're cooking, we say we can smell the gas. What they did was they added an impurity so we can smell it. Alkanes are nonpolar and are insoluble in water, but they are soluble in nonpolar solvents. Alkanes are less dense than water. So this is the idea when you have oil and water together in the same container, you have two layers. What's going to happen is oil, which is an alkane, is going to be on top and water will be on bottom. Alkanes are flammable. We have an increase in melting and boiling point with increasing molecular weight. That's a really important topic to know for organic chemistry, period. Anytime a molecule weighs more, it's going to have a higher melting point or boiling point than something that weighs less. What we will have is sometimes differences in that based on branching and stuff like that. So I really like this picture down here. What I want you to see is both of these molecules have the same weight. So in theory, because they weigh the same, they should have the same boiling points. But because this molecule on the left has a different structure, notice it is a chain of three with two methyl groups coming off of it. It's a tetrahedral shape, so the molecule itself would have a sphere shape. Versus pentane in a straight chain, again, even though it's zigzag, we still refer to that as straight chain, these molecules can lay one on top of each other. So what this picture illustrates is where the two molecules tend to be touching, that's an intermolecular force. They're attracted to each other. If you notice, the molecule on the left has only a couple of places where they're touching, so it's like their glue or their adhesive isn't holding it so well. Versus on the right, there's a lot of intermolecular force holding on. That means if we want to boil this compound, it would take more energy to get them away from each other. Another property of alkanes is their low reactivity. On the next slide, we'll see just a couple of reactions that alkanes can undergo. Reactions of alkanes, again, they tend to be fairly unreactive. The two major reactions that will be covered in this class, the first one, combustion reaction. It's also known as an oxidation reaction. These are reactions when a substance is burned. Now, when you're balancing combustion reactions, I would like you to use molecular formula because it's a lot easier to balance using molecular formula. Please keep in mind the combustion reaction is the only reaction I ask you to use molecular formula for. For all of the reactions you will use structural formula or condensed structural formula. This is the reaction for methane. Methane is commonly used for cooking, I know some people use propane, but methane is the most common. In fact, in our labs at Crafton Hills, this is what we have coming out of our Bunsen burner, CH4, methane. Every combustion reaction will have the organic compound reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, water, and energy or heat. To balance the reactions, it's always easier if you balance carbon first, hydrogen second, and oxygen last. What I suggest you do is somewhere in your notes or on a separate piece of paper, write out this reaction without the coefficients and practice balancing it. Here we have another organic compound. This is an alkane. It's reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide and 
water and energy. And again, my suggestion to you is to go ahead and rewrite this without the coefficients, practice balancing it, and check your work. So how can these questions be asked on an exam? Well, one of the ways that it can be asked is in word form. Remember, combustion reactions only need to be written with molecular formulas. The, per the first problem is write the balanced combustion reaction of propane. So you have to remember what propane looks like. Propane has three carbons. If you keep in mind that formula we had for alkane, CnH2n plus 2, that would be the formula you'd write for propane. And with all combustion reactions, it's the organic compound reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Go ahead and write this yourself, and then come back to the slide and check your work. All right, here is the reaction of propane without balanced coefficients. I want to show you this before I show you the answer. Remember, I suggest balancing carbons first. I have three carbons on this side, only one over here. That means I would have to have a coefficient of three here to balance my carbons. Hydrogens are next. Eight hydrogens here. On the right-hand side, I see that they only come in pairs, so the coefficient would need to be a four. Oxygens are last. On the right-hand side of the arrow, I have six on this side, because that's three times two is six, plus four more, that's 10. On the left-hand side, I see they only come in pairs, so the coefficient here would be a five. Write the combustion reaction of butane. So go ahead and do this whole thing on your own and then come back and check your work. All right, this reaction is gonna cause us to have to double everything because I'm gonna have this odd, even thing happening with oxygen. So if you tried this on your own, you know what I'm talking about. So let me help clarify this. Carbon first, there's four. So over here, I would put a four. Hydrogen, there's 10. They only come in pairs. I'd put a five here. So counting up the total number of oxygens to balance in my four times two, which is eight, plus five is 13. They only come in pairs. So the way I would handle this is I would go ahead and double all the coefficients. So keep in mind, the C4H10 had an understood one coefficient. Remember, if nothing's written there, it's the number one. So I doubled that to two. I'm not gonna do anything to oxygen. I'm gonna save that till last. I'm gonna change this to eight and this to 10. When I do that, you'll see that I'll actually have 8 times 2, 16, plus 10. I have 26 oxygens divided by 2. This becomes 13. The second reaction that alkanes undergo that we're going to talk about is the halogenation reaction. Halogenation simply means halogen is happening. So if you keep in mind the halogens, the second to the last column on the periodic table, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. This particular reaction requires heat or light as a catalyst, so you must write heat or light over the arrow. This is a substitution reaction. In a substitution reaction, an atom takes the place of another atom on a carbon. That's what a substitution reaction is. These reactions should be written using condensed structural formulas. Remember, it was only the combustion reactions that uses molecular formula. You may not use molecular formula for these reactions, and as we get into them a little further, you'll see why. One of the things we have to keep in mind in this reaction, only one halogen can substitute at a time. Here's the general reaction. Now on general reactions, when I give you those, typically I'll try to make it a little more abbreviated, so my R group here can be any size, any shape. And because the action is happening with a substitution of a hydrogen, I went ahead and explicitly showed you one of the hydrogens. The halogens always travel in pairs. They're part of the diatomics. So the halogen that you put here must always have a subscript of two. Heat or light, you can write either the words heat or light, or you can use the delta symbol, which means heat, and the lambda symbol that means light. So the way you need to do this to get full credit on the exam is you can either write the words heat or light above the arrow or you can use these symbols. But you must have heat or light or both of these symbols. You don't have to have all four. 
but you at least have to have two. And if you use the word heat or light, it must be written over the arrow. In this reaction, what happens is our hydrogen that was bonded to this carbon is now substituted with a halogen. So this would be my organic product. And anytime I have another product of the leftover pieces, I tend to call those minor secondary products. So where did the H come from? This H originally came from this alkane here. And where did the X come from? Remember, we had the diatomic in our halogen, so we have one on the alkane and one of them with the hydrogen. So this problem says write the bromination reaction of ethane. It didn't say halogenation. Well, this is how it works. If we say bromination, that means bromine is happening. If we say chlorination, what do you think is happening? That's right, Cl. So go ahead and pause the video. I want you to write out the structure. Remember, it's the condensed structural formula for ethane. React it with the bromo, uh, react it with the halogen, Br. Remember, it's a diatomic, so it'll be Br subscript 2. Your choice of heat or light above the arrow, and then show me your products. All right, normally you wouldn't write CH3, CH2H. I'm just matching up here for illustrative purposes. This would normally be CH3, CH3. If you would like to go ahead and write your hydrogen out like that, at the very beginning of the class, that's acceptable, but as we progress, you wouldn't, you wouldn't write it this way. So here's bromination. I chose to use the symbols heat or light here. Notice the hydrogen that was on this carbon was brominated. And I have a minor secondary product of HBr. The bond line between H and Br is not required. Neither is the bond line between the bromine here and this carbon here. Anytime you have a single bond that's in the horizontal position, they're always optional. Did you notice between the CH3 and the CH2, I didn't show the bond line? You can show the bond line if you want, but you don't have to. You're always required to show bond lines that are vertical or multiple bonds, but horizontal single bonds are always optional. All right, this time I want you to write the chlorination reaction of propane. It's a different molecule, but I want you to take note of propane. Propane has three carbons. Ethane only had two, so if the bromo went to the right side carbon on ethane or the left hand carbon, there would be no difference. But think this one through. In fact, I'm going to give you a big hint before you get started. You actually get two organic compounds as your product and then the minor secondary product. So check this one out. In the chlorination, remember it's a diatomic, I chose to write the heater light and the symbols here. The chlorine can go to the end carbon. Remember the carbon on the left hand side on propane and the right hand side are identical to each other. So I went ahead and wrote my chlorine coming off carbon number one. And then the chlorine can also come off carbon number two. So probably the best way to clear this up is to build models. I keep telling you model kit is very important. If you go ahead and build a model of propane, also build a model of Cl2, remove one of the hydrogens on the terminal carbon you, and put the chlorine here. You'll also have HCl. And then if you go ahead and bring it back to the original propane form, take the hydrogen off the second carbon, put the chlorine there, you'll get this product. In terms of balancing, it's kind of weird with organic chemists. They're not always that interested in balancing everything. So sometimes I'll tell you it must be balanced. Other times it doesn't have to be. So here's the first time where we're going to say it doesn't have to be balanced. That's kind of weird because we just did combustion reactions where it had to be balanced. There is no clear-cut rule on when you balance it and when you don't. So I'll try to give you an update every time. Cycloalkanes. These are unsaturated hydrocarbons. The formula is CnH2n. And remember, the formula for saturation is CnH2n plus 2. So these are unsaturated. Carbons can form cyclic or ring compounds when there are three or more carbons. These compounds have the same number of carbons, but two less hydrogens than the corresponding open chain alkane. That is exactly why they're said to be unsaturated. Cycloalkanes are not isomers with the linear or branched alkane with the same number of carbons. 
again because they do not have the same number of hydrogens. Cyclopropane and cyclobutane are more reactive than the corresponding alkane. This is due to the distortion of the bond angles from 109.5. The angle strain, it's way too big. A cyclopropane, the carbon to carbon to carbon bond in the ring is only 60 degrees. In a cyclobutane, it's 90 degrees. That's way too far from the 109.5, which is the standard or the base that we look at. You can see from the models of these compounds that the rings are fairly rigid. The carbon-carbon bonds cannot be rotated or, or even move relative to one another until you get to larger rings consisting of five or more carbon atoms. All right, for this section, I have already in your notes put some structures in there. I want you to go ahead and draw all these structures in and then I'll talk you through them. All right, if you hadn't had a chance to draw all these structures into your lecture notes, go ahead and pause the video and draw all these structures in. All right, let's take a look at what we have here. Cyclopropane, three carbons. Each carbon has a bond to carbon to the left and to the right of it, so it already has two bonds. It only has room for two hydrogens. When we have ring structures, if you notice, even with cyclopropane, it is not easy to explicitly show all the hydrogens. So the condensed structural formula for cyclopropane would have CH2 groups. Now, the best way to do rings, and the way that you are allowed to do this, is the skeletal or ring structure. Now, the skeletal ring structure is acceptable on the first exam for only ring systems. So the neat thing about cyclopropane, anytime you have a bend or an end, there's a carbon there, so it's literally a triangle. Be careful, however, not to blend these two types. If you're going to connect the bonds, as I did in the triangle here, it is not the same as this carbon here. I want you to notice the bond lines don't actually touch. They're actually bonded to carbon, so please be careful when you draw those. Cyclobutane expanded, cyclobutane structural condensed, and the line structure. With cyclopentane, I chose to go ahead and show you the dashed wedge, solid wedge version. I do want you to build this model. When you get to cyclopentane, your model kit should be able to handle it. Cyclopropane and cyclobutane, the bonds are too distorted. It's really hard to make that model. I highly recommend making a cyclopentane molecule, and in fact, you're going to be required on the next one, cyclohexane, to make it, so you may as well get started. We have the expanded structure, we have the condensed structural formula, and the ring structure. Again, you get to use this version, and it's much easier. The only drawback on using a line structure is you have to keep in mind that each carbon on each corner has two hydrogens. Make sure you keep that in mind when you use the line structure. Cyclohexane. In fact, cyclohexane, I didn't do the expanded. I need you to go ahead and build a model of cyclohexane because in the next couple slides we're going to be manipulating it quite a bit. Cyclohexane and its conformations. So when you have your model, go ahead and after you make the cyclohexane, notice that there's flexibility. And you need to go ahead and manipulate your model to look like this. It's going to take some practice. One of the things that we've learned about cyclohexane is because it's a large enough ring structure that it has flexibility and it actually prefers to be in what's called the chair position over the boat position. You, you will be needing to know how to draw the chair conformation of cyclohexane and in fact the one I'm circling is only its template, it's not the answer. The one in the middle would be the answer because cyclohexane would have six carbons and 12 hydrogens and you must show them. So the middle piece here is the answer if you are asked to draw the chair conformation of cyclohexane the answer would only be this one in the middle. The one to the right is the template so you can practice writing those. I need you to also notice that the hydrogens that I have in red those are known as axial hydrogens. When you draw those lines they must go straight up and down and the pattern is, do you notice how this carbon is up here? Just like in my model over here. Whenever you have the carbon higher, 
then the axial hydrogen goes straight up and it alternates. So you would draw this bond going straight up, coming around the ring, the next axial would come down, the next one straight up, the next one straight down, and as we go around the ring, straight up and straight down. There are six axial hydrogens in the chair conformation of cyclohexane. The axial are shown in the drawing here. The equatorial ones are the ones that are coming out, that are radiating out. And again, please build the model in my face-to-face -face class. They're always required to build the model while we're in class talking about this. So I don't want you to not have that experience. Hi, I want to show you using your model kit to understand boat and chair of cyclohexane. After you build your model, you want to go ahead and have all of the carbons planar. You need to hold two bonds across from each other, parallel to the floor. This carbon, you need to pull up. This carbon over here, you need to pull down. And keeping these two parallel to the floor. When you put this down on the table, you should have three feet like table legs. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure these are exactly straight up and down. And I want you to notice that they alternate. This is down. This one's up. I'm going to make sure this one's straight up. This one's down, straight up. So it alternates where you have three of them straight down, three of them straight up. In fact, what's touching my hands right now are the axial positions, and the ones coming around are the equatorial. To convert it to the boat, go ahead and start at the starting position, start it flat, holding two of the bonds across from each other, pull both sides up in this case, and there you will have the boat. So the hydrogens that are coming out of the ring, a little bit off the middle, those are all called equatorial. When you draw the equatorial, make sure you don't draw the bond line 90 degrees because it's 109.5, so bring it down a bit. I'm not going to be real picky if it's not exactly 109.5, but I will not accept if it's 90 degrees. It must be more. When you draw the axial hydrogen, remember that one goes straight up and down, the equatorial is going to be more, about 109 degrees, it's going to be a bigger bond angle than 90, keep that in mind. So when you draw the equatorial, make sure that you draw, if the hydrogen axial goes up, this one will go down, and you always draw them radiating away from the center. Coming around the circle, because we're past the middle, it'll be going in this direction, down, up, down, and again, we're past the center again, so it's gonna, radi it's gonna radiate away from the center, it's gonna go in this direction. Definitely practice drawing that. Keep in mind, this is the template, this is not the answer. You must always show me the hydrogens. All right, the Newman projection for the chair conformation, this is its template. I'm gonna go ahead and draw in all the hydrogens. Remember, I've got 12 hydrogens to show. I'm going to go ahead and draw in all the hydrogens on the Newman projection, and I need you to fill those in. All right, I filled in all the hydrogens the best I could on the Newman projection. Make sure you have those filled in. For the boat, there is no such thing as axial or equatorial. So what happens is this molecule, because of its ring structure, it's very flexible. So take your model and start flexing it backwards and forwards and up and down. And one of the positions that it takes is called the boat. So it kind of looks like a boat. So here is what it looks like with all the hydrogens drawn in. So definitely practice how to draw it and take note of the location of the hydrogens. Notice that all my bond lines are more than 90 degrees. That's probably the key piece. And you really don't want to have any hydrogen straight up or straight down in this one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and fill in the hydrogens on the Newman projection. All right, I went ahead and filled in the hydrogens on the Newman projection. Keep in mind, if you're asked on the exam to draw the Newman projection of either a chair or a boat, the templates are not the full answer. You must always show me all the hydrogens on both the Newman projection of the chair and the boat. 
just like you have to show me all the hydrogens on the chair conformation and boat conformation of cyclohexane. So how do you see the boat and chair with the Newman projection? I'm going to go ahead and put this back into the chair position. Remember, three down, three up. When you're looking at this model to better understand the Newman projection, this is the viewpoint you want. You want two carbons, one in front of the other on this side, and two carbons, one in front of the, one in front of the other on this side. So take a look at this. This is, let me get the angle a little better. This is representing the Newman projection of the chair, and you can see how all the bonds are staggered. Let me convert it to the boat. This is the model of the boat, and when you're looking at it from the Newman projection, this is the viewpoint you want to look at it, where these two carbons are in front of each other, so these would be the two circles, and you can see that all the bonds are eclipsed. For cyclohexane, there's considerable amount of steric and torsional strain in the boat form. Steric means things are in the way. Torsional means the bond angles are horrible. Take a look at the Newman projection. Do you notice how all of my hydrogen bonds are eclipsed? Eclipse conformation always is more stressed out, whereas the staggered in the chair conformation is always less energy. So this is asking us a question here, or actually it's giving us a statement here. The cyclohexane prefers to be in the one that takes less energy to be in, so it prefers to be in the chair conformation. So in your notes, you don't have it in there, I want you to go ahead and draw this style arrow. What this is showing me is the longer arrow to the left is saying it would rather be in the chair form, and the shorter arrow to the right says, well, every once in a while, it'll go to the boat. Nomenclature of ring compounds. For monosubstituted, meaning only one thing's on the ring, you name the substituent first, then the parent compound. Don't forget the word cyclo, and you write it as one word. And you don't give the address of where the substituent's coming off because it's understood it's on ca the carbon number one. And in fact, if I were to rewrite methyl cyclohexane, put the CH3 on the opposite side, it would be the exact same compound, just rotated. I have the name colorized again because I wanted you to see that each piece has a meaning. The parent name of this compound is cyclohexane. Cyclo meaning my carbons in a ring. Hex means six carbons and A and E, they're all single bonded. Cyclohexane is the parent name of this compound and coming off of the parent is a methyl group. For polysubstituted rings, we're going to use the following IUPAC nomenclature. First, you're going to number in the direction, either clockwise or counterclockwise, which will give the lowest composite number for all the substituents. If there's a tie, then you'd start with the one that's alphabetically first. The one that's alphabetically first gets to be on carbon number one. Then after that, you either go clockwise or counterclockwise away from carbon number one to make sure the next substituent has the lowest next number. To name them, you list the substituents alphabetically then the parent name. Remember, this is exactly what we did before. Substituents first, parent name last. You're going to write it as one word, and don't forget cyclo. All right, I have the names listed here in your notes. I would like you to go ahead and pause the video, and in your notes, go ahead and attempt to draw these structures. I always think it's best for students to at least try to apply the knowledge that they have first, and then if you make any mistakes, you can note those mistakes now and correct them now. And hopefully those same mistakes will not happen on the exam. So again, please pause the video, go ahead and draw these structures, and when you're finished, come back and take a look. All right, for the first one, cyclohexane is the parent. I have two methyls coming off of one and four relative to each other. You'd have a cyclohexane ring with methyl groups on opposite sides of each other. So when you drew this, if you happen to make your cyclohexane where the peak is at the top, that's exactly the same as if I have the top flat. It's just a rotation. It's okay. Also, you can put your methyl groups on any of these corners. All they have to do is be across from each other. So most likely, if you drew a cyclohexane, 
and your CH3 groups are diagonal to each other, completely across from each other, you're fine. You did it exactly correct. 1-ethyl-2-methyl-cyclohexane. Why did I name this 1-ethyl and not 1-methyl? It's because going in this direction, I would have this as a number 1 and this as a number 2. Going in the opposite direction, I would have this as a 1 and this as a 2. So they're tied relative to each other. In fact, when we look at it, they're at a 1, 2 position regardless if I look at them clockwise or counterclockwise. All right, because I have a 1, 2 position clockwise or counterclockwise, because this group ethyl has an E, it's alphabetically first, it gets to be carbon number 1. In fact, it's this carbon here that gets to be carbon number 1, and this carbon here gets to be carbon number 2 in my numbering system. All right, 1, 1, 3, trifluorocyclohexane. I like this example because it reminds us that we have actually two positions on each corner, so I could have two fluoros on there. The number one mistake students sometimes make is they put FL instead of just F. Check yours, make sure it's only F. All right, go ahead and take a look at the other three examples. Check your work. Oh, let's look at this one down here. 1-T-butyl-3-isopropyl. These names here, these came from earlier in your notes. Take a look at your notes. I think it's about page 11. And right here, this group here is known as an isopropyl. And this group here is known as a t-butyl. So this is one example of how these common names can be used in, in nomenclature. One of the things I like students to do is when I give you questions and practice problems in your notes where I give you, for example, this time I gave you the name and I ask you to write the structure. Don't forget for practice, you can go ahead and write down the structure and regenerate the name and you have something you can check with. So anytime I give you nomenclature, and in fact, if you recall earlier in your lecture notes, I've been giving you the names of everything even before we started naming, use all of those as examples and practice with them. Biochemical interest. Anytime I have biochemical interest, you don't need to know all the information. This class also, along with organic chemistry, covers some biochem, and I'll be taking some biochem and dispersing it throughout. So before we get right into this, the most common question students ask me at this point is, do we have to memorize that these are explosive or they're used in dentistry? Nope. In fact, that's why it's biochemical interest. I want you to listen to what these different compounds can be used for. What you would be required to do is if you give if you're given the name, you have to give me the structure or the structure and give me the name. But I'm not going to give you the common names. I would only give you the IUPAC. So you would probably never even notice that it's one from this group here. So let's just take a look. Cyclopropane is used as an anesthetic. It's usually mixed with helium as it tends to form explosive mixtures when mixed with oxygen. 1-bromo, one 1-chloro, one 2 2 2 trifluoral ethane. That's its IUPAC name. Its common name, it actually has two, halothane and fluorothane. It's used in dentistry as an anesthetic. Chloroethane is also known as ethyl chloride. In fact, its common name is ethyl chloride, and some people still use that. It's used as a local anesthetic as it cools on the skin with evaporation. That's its common name, carbon tetrachloride. It has a nickname, carbon tet. Its IUPAC name is tetrachloromethane. It was once used as a general anesthetic until it was found to cause liver damage. Kind of glad they stopped doing that. And this next one I think is kind of fun because you have the chlorines on every corner. It's known as hexachlorocyclohexane. Well, I actually have a problem with that name and they even call it the IUPAC. It needs to be named 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, hexachlorohexane. The reason why it needs to have the numbers is, if you recall, on each corner there's actually room for two chloros, so it needs to be more specific. So its IUPAC name of hexachlorocyclohexane, don't memorize that because that is an IUPAC name, but it's a common name, and you basically need to, well, I would never ask you this one, by the way, but you would need to identify the location of every chlorine with a number. So it's 
commercial name is Lindane. It's used to kill mites and lice, which are known to infect humans. This compound must be used with caution because it's fat-soluble and non-biodegradable.